this afternoon's session of the Enterprise Project. We have with us Rich Parnell of XCOR. Um, I want to, uh, you know, I, I took time out of this weekend, this long weekend, to come here because I like to say that I have the best job in the world. Uh, I get to go around and tell people about rockets and what XCOR does. And um, uh, the company is about four years old and we're based in Mojave, California, which is uh, pretty much right between Edwards Air Force Base and China Lake. Um, Mojave Airport is sort of a business park for aviation companies, and uh, so everything from uh, rockets to custom-made airplanes to uh, the Champion Airway Search are based out of there. Um, uh, what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about the company here and what we're doing and where we're going and show you some of the videos of some of the projects and things like that that we've done, as well as we're planning on doing. Uh, including showing you some of the video of uh, some of the new engines that we've been testing as well. So, um, uh, the company is, uh, uh, like I said, it's about four years old, and our main uh, uh, competency is in building rocket engines. Uh, uh, generally, we're uh, liquid fuel rocket engines. Um, uh, we have uh, done four series of engines, and uh, we started out. About four years ago, in um, the end of sort of the catch-22 in this business of you don't get customers until you have something built, you don't get anything built until you have money from the customers. And to, to start short-circuiting that, what we did, what we've done is to start by taking very small steps. And initially, the, uh, the first very small step that we did was in building a 15-pound uh, engine um, uh, with all of the properties that we want in future engines in terms of uh, being able to be cooled, multiple restarts, and most importantly is being able to fire and run the engines with, with as little or no maintenance in between, um, in between firings or flights. Um, so we started off with the 15 uh, pound engine here. I'll show you a little bit about, show you a little video here. Unfortunately, we were not able to, to find a market. 
Um, some people like to say that the reason why we didn't find a buyer for that is because uh, the ME-163 never had machine guns on it. We originally uh, tried to do an X1 replica, and then we went to an air show and we found out that uh, people were only interested in uh, Warbird replicas, and the you know, X1 was uh, merely an experimental aircraft, um, although uh, both are equally important. So uh, we pursued an ME163 uh, replica for a while, but yeah, as Rich says, we never really found a higher fire than that. So, in, in lieu of finding somebody to pay me for developing that, um, we decided that we still wanted to do some sort of development program uh, to not only uh, you know, develop some of the engines that we that, that we had had on the design um, sheets, uh, but as well be able to show people what we were capable of. And uh, our chief engineer actually had a, uh, a Long Easy, which is a, um, uh, a pusher airplane. Actually, if you go to the, the aviation, the Heller Aviation Museum, uh, right on 101 up in Redwood Shores, actually has a Long Easy on the roof of it, and it's one of these airplanes with the uh, props in back. And the airplane had had a hard landing and it needed a new engine. And uh, so we started thinking about what, um, we realized that this would be a perfect, uh, uh, what we call the donor aircraft for uh, being able to uh, develop our engines. And so we uh, went out and raised the capital from private investors, um, a little under half a million dollars. And uh, the, originally we thought it would take a million dollars in a year and ended up taking uh, half a million dollars in six months um, to be able to develop the Easy Rocket. Um, the Easy Rocket has two 400 pound regeneratively cooled engines, so um, uh, from scale, which is the engine you saw there, the engines are about the size of a Coke can. And uh, so to start, when we develop the engines, um, so for example, the picture that in the background here is our test stand, uh, where we test the rocket engines um, before we put them on flying vehicles. Uh, so this is the, the test stand is actually a converted trailer. Um, it's, had, it's had many modifications made to it, and uh, so we first started by putting the 400 pound engine on there. So I'm going to show you uh, some video here from some of the engine tests for that.
came right at the end there, that's the shutdown transit. So as we as you shut down the engine, there's still some extra fuel in there, and it's just uh, uh, a little bit extra fuel that burns off really quickly. Um, uh, so as we once we've got the engine um, to a point uh, on the test stand that we're comfortable with it and reliable uh, with the engine, um, then the next thing we want to do is just put it on the vehicle. So uh, the next video I'm going to show you here is the, uh, the our static test with the engines uh, on the actual easy rocket. The bottles on the ground there, those are helium bottles. Um, uh, we use that as a pressure for our engines. This is maybe about a third of a uh, record-breaking three-minute-long engine run that we did on the ground. Uh, normally, with both engines running,
Um, so uh, the next thing I'll show you is, is I guess the
as far as we know, this is the first time in uh, a rocket-powered vehicle had ever been uh, a piloted rocket-powered vehicle had ever been flown in an air show. We actually got air show insurance, um, which covers uh, in case the airplane crashes into a crowd. And I think that that's also probably one of the first times that that's ever happened for a rocket-powered vehicle. Um, it was not cheap, and we found out at the last minute. But fortunately, we were able to work something out. Uh, so we'll show the video here. Now. So you can see airplanes in the background, they're constantly moving stuff forward. And they're actually on the uh, runway for the first flight, and F-15 took off right in front of them and shot jet blocks all over them. So you can see he's got one engine lift, and there goes the second. This was the easy part. The hard part was trucking the airplane across the country on the trailer for three days. <laughs> Great airplane, but it doesn't have any rain. You can fly there. Yeah, the, it was interesting getting the airplane on the trailer, too, because the airplane with the wings off is nine and a half feet wide, and eight and a half feet is the limit before you need a wide load permit. So they actually had to stick the airplane sideways to get it on the, on the trailer. He, never, he, he doesn't quite have enough thrust to get completely vertical. Um, you know, when you see the, the views outside of the back wing, He's actually kind of doing a wing over. It, it makes it look almost like he's going straight up. Um, but if you look at the dials, uh, the cockpit shots, the, uh, the climb meter's head. Um, so here's the restart. So actually, I just want to probably back this up here. So um, uh, that was the, the easy rocket. Now is uh, 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 at the 
current time sitting in the hangar, uh, we do have some ideas of some things we uh, uh, may want to use it for. Um, it would still just purely be a demonstrator. And one of those things is uh, uh, we're working on a new uh, pump fed engine now. Um, it's uh, in, the, in the 15 to 2,000 pound uh, class. Um, we don't know the exact numbers yet until we, we get the engine fully working. Um, uh, but in this, we want to do a, uh, a, a pump uh, fed engine um, that, that increase the basically the advantages of a, the advantage of a pump fed engine is that you can uh, it cuts down the amount of weight you don't have to bring as much pressure in tanks and things like that. So we're now working on a, uh, a piston pump. Um, we have a, uh, a contract with uh, the Department of Defense um, uh, to develop for, for research for research uh, uh, program for developing this pump, and uh, so we have a uh, video here of the pump working. It's a it's a piston pump, and, uh, and it's not quite as exciting as the rocket engines, but this technology is as critical. It's really. So there's the, that's the first version of the pump, it's basically a framework of that, it's not going to use the final flight components, but we, um, uh, well, I'll let you do the top of here. We decided that the price is high for development, production price, That's the water coming out from the pump there. So that's alcohol. Spark plugs, you know, 
billions of dollars of research have been put into developing better, better spark plugs, and so for what we wanted to do, it was a perfect fit. So, um, I'll show you the, the video for the 1800 pound engine. Um, so what we do is, is when we first uh, uh, we first test the engine on the test stand, we actually do um, we're testing like the size of the chamber and things like that. So uh, what we'll do is we'll uh, fire this engine, and then based on what we learned from that, go back and then build another version of that. And then once we're comfortable with chamber size and everything, then we'll build the, the final version of the engine that'll have regenerative cooling and things like that. So in this one, you'll see that the engine runs are actually very short, you know, only a couple of seconds because it's being uh, cooled by a blade. Um, so in other words, there is um, uh, it's like a phenolic that actually goes around the chamber and it burns off as it gets hot, and then we turn off the engine before that, that's all been burned off, and so that provides the cooling on the engine. So it's good for running for a couple of runs. Um, and our approach in testing engines is to try and uh, you know, test the engines, learn from that, make changes, and in many cases we'll uh, learn from that, make changes, you know, we'll test in the morning, learn from that, make changes in the shop, and then be back out in the afternoon uh, testing again. And that dramatically cuts down your costs and your timelines for developing this So I'll show you a quick video here of the 1500-pound engine. Ready? It's anywhere from 15 to 2000. And this is a liquid oxygen kerosene engine. So it'll have uh, uh, better performance than ISP compared to the easy rocket. So the uh, the white smoke that you see coming out of there first, um, what we do is with that is that we flow the liquid oxygen through the lines first because it cools everything. And so what will happen is, is when the liquid oxygen hits the, um, the metal lines and things like that, when you first uh, Start the, when you first start the ignition process, the lines will, um, will cool and that will affect them. So you run the liquid oxygen for a little bit uh, to get everything to the same temperature and then you start uh, the engine. So um, uh, that, I guess that engine is going to be, um, uh, we're, that, that engine is going to be what we're developing for, uh, what we look for for the next generation uh, vehicle that we want to build. Which sort of gets us to the point of, well, what is it we're doing and, you know, why are we in this business? Um, uh, you know, a lot of people now have focused on this, you know, with the XPRIZE as well as people seeing the opportunities there, a lot of people are now focusing on uh, building suborbital vehicles um, as opposed to, you know, 10 years ago when everyone was on the, uh, the single stage to orbit train. Um, people have realized that, you know, doing a vehicle like that's really hard and you need to have some sort of operating experience, uh, you know, flying things before you're going to get the credibility to, to get the, you know, the multi-million dollar missions for taking satellites up or any other large people. So, a lot of people focus on the, the, the suborbital market. Our approach in that in developing the suborbital market is, is to focus on low cost of operations. Um, for something like the, the X Prize, you don't have to. Um, you only have to fly twice in two weeks. So there are a lot of things you can do to cut down your development time and your development costs, whether they be using uh, parachutes or uh, certain types of engines or, or carrier vehicles. Things like there's all sorts of different things you can do to cut down your development time and your development costs. Um, our focus though is purely on the per flight cost. We feel that the approach that we're going after of a rocket powered uh, runway takeoff um, and dead stick landing vehicle is the lowest cost operations. Um, you only have one, one, one vehicle, you have engines that hopefully you can uh, you know, fly multiple times in a day and uh, <clears throat> you, you can do it with a minimum amount of ground crew. So, um, We've got some video of uh, what we plan on building. These are you know, nominal designs. Things change. We're not showing this thing. This is what we're we're going to build. This is this is what we are thinking of uh, doing uh, as we raise the money and the contracts to be able to pay for uh, the set development program. So um, the, uh, the name of the vehicle is the Zerus. Um, uh, we named the development names for our vehicles are all uh, animals with the letter X because um, we have you know, the company named X4 and. She likes the letter X, all of his kids have the letter X in their names and you know, put whatever <laughs> in there. So, um, the Xerus is an African ground squirrel. So, um, so this is the passenger configuration. There are three different missions that we've designed for this vehicle. One is to carry uh, uh, tourist passengers up to suborbit and back. Um, and uh, uh, another configuration like this would be also to take scientific payloads uh, up as 
well. Um, things that would normally go up on uh, sounding rockets uh, to get a couple of minutes of zero G. Um, so with the uh, with the passengers, we have an agreement, a marketing agreement with uh, Space Adventures. Um, so uh, to be able to have them sell the rides on this, uh, uh, assuming we get this bill. Um, so this will be. Uh, X price class ride of uh, you know, 100 kilometers. Um, the ride's about a half hour. Uh, starts coming out during the day. Uh, if you fly from Mojave uh, Airport, uh, you'll be able to see Las Vegas and Los Angeles at the same time. Uh, it gives you some sort of idea of the view that you would have uh, from that. So as Mike said, that that in that configuration, that would purely be for passengers for starting to payloads. Um, you know, we think that there's not only a significant market for uh, taking passengers up but also for microgravity and scientific experiments. Uh, this is going to be about four minutes of uh, high quality microgravity. Normally in drop tubes, you get about two to three seconds of microgravity. And in parabolic flights, you get about 20 to 30 seconds of not incredibly high quality uh, zero gravity. And the only option beyond that is sounding rockets, which are several million dollars, um, or going up the International Space Station, which Iraq costs you 20 million uh, to get a rack on the International Space Station. But, uh, right now, there's not a lot of astronaut time to do that kind of stuff as well. Um, currently, corporate America does not invest in microgravity. Um, uh, and we think that, that that's not just a function of cost, it's also a function of how the product is delivered to people. Um, you know, in research and development, if uh, you know, you're going to get your answer in two to three years, that's outside of the horizon for most research departments, for uh, most corporations. Um, but being able to take your payload up uh, on short notice, uh, bring it back down, uh, be able to tweak your experiment and take it back up. Uh, we think it would be very advantageous for these customers, um, much more so than just price, because they're not completely price driven. So in other words, you can uh, tweak your experiment and bring it back up over and over again uh, to be able to develop um, whatever you're just doing. The other thing about microgravity is, is that um, you can do research, microgravity, you can do research in microgravity, but then do your actual manufacturing on the ground. Um, so one of the examples of that is combustion research in that they were actually doing that on the, uh, the last Columbia mission. That was one of the experiments they brought up. In microgravity, you can uh, droplets are round shape as opposed to droplet shape. And so you can test the properties of the ignition systems and things like that, and diesel engines and stuff like that. Uh, in microgravity, you'll be able to isolate variables and then bring the, the, the payload back down and do your manufacturing on Earth. And so there are a lot of industries we think that are like that that could take advantage of uh, having a low cost, uh, easy to use, um, microgravity vehicle. The last market is in uh, uh, taking uh, payload, microsatellite payloads. Um, and in this, we see using an expendable upper stage, uh, which I'll show you here in the video, that puts 10 to 20 kilograms uh, into low Earth orbit. Like I said, these are not well designed, they may change as we go.
that's sort of a quick overview of the business. So, uh, all of, before I open up to questions, uh, one of the things is when we were at AirVenture last year, we spent the whole week there uh, in uh, the, the in Wisconsin somewhere. It actually literally melted our booth in the, like the you know uh, the pictures and things like that. We're all delaminating the heat humidity, and so we we're out there for all week, the whole week. We always have to leave. So before I take your questions, we always have to get the same three questions. We'll answer those first before we uh, have any questions. And the three questions we always get are number one, uh, what about the XPRIZE? Um, uh, we think the XPRIZE is a great thing, and if we get this thing built, no one's won it, no one will go for it. Um, but otherwise, we think that uh, there's, there are other folks that are probably a lot closer. Uh, the second question we get is, uh, what does Burford Tan have to do with this? Um, uh, the answer is, uh, uh, the only thing he has to do with it is that he's the brother of our test pilot. Uh, Bert's working on his own program, uh, and he's had a lot of success with that, and we wish him best of luck. And um, uh, uh, the third question we always get is, uh, what does NASA think about this? And we always have the same three questions all the time. We talk about, we just realized, you know, we, we knew we were getting these questions. And as far as uh, what NASA thinks of this is, uh, generally this is not the type of program that, that they do. Um, generally they're focused on you know, pushing the envelope in terms of technology. Uh, or exploration and deep space and things like that. Um, you know, uh, in our view, though, is that the business needs to focus on low cost of operations. Um, uh, I look at, at space transportation as uh, you know, to use Silicon Valley speak as an industry enabling technology, uh, similar to uh, CDM, what Qualcomm did with CDMA. In that uh, you only have with your cell phones originally had analog. Uh, you only had so much. You only had so many calls in the existing bandwidth that you had. Once Qualcomm was able to come with CDMA and be able to, to fit more phone calls using uh, you know, this type of spread, spread spectrum technology, you could fit up so many more phone calls and all of a sudden on the same bandwidth. So now all of a sudden you have a phone industry uh, or a cell phone industry that's no longer incredibly expensive and everyone has one of these, unfortunately, sometimes. Um, uh, and you know, it, it's similar to what Intel has done with microprocessors in that if you don't have cheap microprocessors, you don't have a PC industry, regardless of the advances that are made in software and telecommunications and everything else like that. Unless you can make processors uh, fast and cheap, uh, you don't have a PC industry. And uh, if you don't have low cost transportation of space, you don't have a space industry. Uh, you know, Highland probably can put it a lot more succinctly and just simply saying, you know, if you get to lower orbit, you're halfway anywhere else in the solar system. And uh, we, we feel that that's the case here with space transportation is that as you develop low cost, uh, easy uh, transportation that fits the customer requirements, you'll see a lot more demand than what we currently have for launches here now. So if anybody has any questions, uh, uh, go right ahead. Depends how well the development program goes. If the development program goes great, then yeah, we can go the idea is that class of that size and will be about five Is there a question back? Uh, yeah, just curious. I, I know you were looking for this. How goes the search for the back end of the uh, sub um, we, uh, we recently just did a round for a little under $200,000 as so part of this government contract. Um, uh, where for every dollar private investment raised, the department has to four dollars, and so we were able to successfully raise a, you know close to two hundred grand. And you know over the past year, it's probably been the worst in terms of capital markets uh, that it's ever been. Um, things are getting better now. Uh, uh, we need to raise, depending on contract costs, things like that, about eight to ten million to build the Zeros. Um, and in today's environment, we're beginning to see you know, investors always go in. You know, I always call fear and greed cycles. Uh, right now, they're beginning to get greedy now. The capital markets tend to get better before the rest of the economy gets better. And so, so far, we're, we're, you know, things are going a lot better, not just, I think, because the markets are improving, but also because pretty much every, you know, every millionaire has now got a, a rocket company. It's becoming like the slow thing to do. And, you know, as people see that, they want it themselves. And, uh, uh, you know, in the investment community, nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd. Um, two, two quick questions. Have you guys ever fouled any of the No, because we don't use anything. We do everything we can to, to avoid you know, using anybody. 
the answer is no. Uh, it limited us in some in some ways, and like our CFO asked me on the other side of the office because he's Australian, because you know they're, they're such a bad ally and everything. Um, so far, the ITAR restrictions haven't hurt us. Um, uh, I mean, it's a big problem for the entire industry as far as I, ITAR goes, and uh, you know, unless someone gets Chris Cox to change his mind, there's there's not going to be any uh, uh, any movement on that. I don't see at least in this Congress here. Yeah, you'd have to ask, uh, probably your best bet would be uh, Doug Jones. Send email to Doug, you're an expert, he can probably answer that for you. I'm not, I do, my, my job is actually to do uh, investor relations and fundraising, and uh, Mike Massey here does the website and the video and everything else like that. And uh, so neither of us is rocket scientist by trade. And that was another question. Could we get that DVD? Uh, this one? Yeah. Uh, probably not. Most of these videos are on the website. But uh, there is no distribution of DVD with this stuff on it. Yeah, you can go to our website and download all these videos. Yeah, so, so. just being able to show that on something like this. Is a cool yeah, job. well, if you like to be a part of them, we can talk about them. Okay. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Well, we appreciate you guys taking your uh, time out on this uh, Saturday long weekend. And